This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. Worldwide. Check them out at betterhelp.com slash Lex. That's betterhelp.com slash Lex. This is the Lex Friedman Podcast, and here is my conversation with Boris Softman. Who is your favorite robot in science fiction, books or movies? Wally and R2-D2, where they were able to convey such an incredible degree of intent, emotion, and kind of character attachment without having any language whatsoever. Um, and just purely through the emotion, richness of um, emotional interaction. So those are... form maybe the challenge is it's super expensive to engineer to, to build but you can imagine maybe not a machine of war yeah. but you can imagine terminator type robots walking around yeah. uh and then the same obviously with, with wally you've basically so for people who don't know you uh created the company anki that created uh, a small robot with a big personality called cosmo that just it does exactly what wally does which is somehow with very few basic visual tools is able to communicate a depth of emotion. And that's fascinating. Uh, but then again, the humanoid form is uh, super compelling. So like uh, Cosmo is very distant from a humanoid form. Yeah. And then the Terminator has a humanoid form. And you can imagine yeah. both of those actually being in our society. It's true. And it's interesting because um, it, it was very intentional to go really far away from human form when you think about a character like Cosmo or like Wally, where um, you can completely rethink uh, the constraints you put on that character, um, what tools you leverage, and then how you actually create a personality uh, and a level of intelligence interactivity that actually matches the constraints that you're under, whether it's uh, mechanical or sensors or... <laughs> And by moving away from human form, you can actually uh, change the rules and embrace your strengths and bypass your weaknesses. And at the same time, the human form like has way too many degrees of freedom to play with. It's it's kind of con counterintuitive, just as you're saying. But when you have fewer constraints, it's almost harder to master the the, the communication of emotion. Like you see this with cartoons, like stick figures. You can communicate quite a lot with just very minimal, like two dots for eyes and a line for, for a smile. I think it, like you can almost communicate arbitrary levels of emotion with just two dots and a line. Yeah. And like that's enough. And if you focus on just that, you can communicate the full range. And then yeah. you, like, if you do that, then you can focus on the actual magic of, of, uh, human and, dot line interaction versus all the engineering mess that's right like dimensionality voice all these sort of things they actually become a crutch yeah. where you get lost in the search space almost um and so some of the best animators that we've worked with um they almost like study when they come up uh you know kind of a lot of ways um you know, when we thought when we thought about Cosmo, I was like, you're, you're right. Like, our if we had to like describe it in like one small phrase, it was bringing a Pixar character to life in the real world. It's uh, it's, it's what we were going for, and um, and in a lot of ways, what was interesting is that with like Wally, which we studied incredibly deeply, and in fact, some of our team were you know kind of had worked previously at um, at Pixar and on that project. Um, they intentionally constrained Wally as well, even though in an animated film you could do whatever you wanted to because it forced you to like really saturate the smaller amount of dimensions, but uh, you sometimes end up getting a far more beautiful output um, because you're pushing at the extremes um, of this emotional space in a way that 
you just wouldn't because you get lost in the surface area uh, mm-hmm. if you have like something that is just infinitely articulable. So if we backtrack a little bit, and uh, you thought of Cosmo in 2011 and 2013 actually uh, designed and built it. What is Anki? What is Cosmo? I guess who is Cosmo? Who is <laughs> and Cosmo? Uh, uh, what was the vision behind this incredible little robot? We started uh, Anki back in like, like while we were still in graduate school. So myself and my two co-founders, we were PhD students uh, in the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and so we were uh, studying robotics, AI, machine learning, kind of different, you know, different uh, uh, areas. One of my co-founders was working on walking robots, uh, you know, uh, for a period of time. And so we all had a um, a bit of a really deep, kind of a, a deeper passion for applications of robotics and AI, where um, th- there's like a spectrum where there's people that get like really fascinated by the theory of AI and machine learning and robotics, where um, whether it gets applied in the near future or not is less of a kind of factor on them, but they love the pursuit of the, like the challenge, and that's necessary. And there's a lot of incredible breakthroughs that happen there. We're probably closer to the other end of the spectrum where we love the technology and the um, and all the evolution of it, but we were really driven by applications, like how can you really reinvent experiences and functionality and build value that wouldn't have been possible without um, these approaches, and and that's what drove us. And we had a kind of some experiences through previous jobs and internships where we like got to see the applied side of robotics. And at that time, there was actually relatively few applications of robotics um, that were outside of, um, you know, peer research or industrial applications, um, military applications and so forth. There were very few outside of it. So maybe, you know, iRobot was like one exception and maybe there were a few others, but for the most part, there weren't that many. And so we got excited about consumer applications of robotics where you could leverage way higher levels of intelligence um, through software to create value and experiences that were just not possible um, in in those fields today. Um, and we saw kind of a, a, a pretty wide range of applications um, that varied in the complexity of what it would take to actually solve those. And what we wanted to do was to commercialize this into a company, but actually do a bottoms up approach where we could have a huge impact in a space that was ripe to have an impact at that time and then build up off of that and move into other areas. And entertainment became the place to start mm-hmm. because um, you had relatively little innovation in the toy space and uh, entertainment space. You had these really rich um, experiences in video games and uh, and movies, but there was like this chasm in between. And so we thought that we could really reinvent that experience. And there was a a really fascinating transition technically that was happening at the time where the cost of components was plummeting because of the mobile phone industry and then the smartphone industry. And so the cost of a microcontroller, of a camera, of a motor, of memory, of microphones, cameras. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't have been possible previously. Um, And so... um, we really got excited about that and how we push all the complexity from the physical world into software by using really inexpensive components, but putting huge amounts of complexity into the AI side. And so Cosmo became our second product and then the one that we're probably most proud of. The idea there was to create a physical character that had enough understanding and awareness of the physical world around it and the context that mattered to feel like uh, like he was alive. Um, and. Uh, to be able to have these like emotional kind of connections and experiences with people that you would typically only find uh, inside of a movie. And the motivation very much was was Pixar. Like we had an incredible uh, respect and appreciation for what they were able to um, build in this like really beautiful fashion and film. Um, but it was always like a, you know, one, it was virtual and two, it was like a story on rails that had no interactivity to it. It was uh, very fixed. And it obviously had a magic to it, but where you really start to hit like a different level of experiences when you're actually able to physically interact with our robot. And, and then that was your idea with Anki, like the first product was the cars. Yeah. So basically you take, you take a toy, you add intelligence into it in the same way you would add intelligence into AI systems within a video game, but you're not bringing it into the physical space. So the idea is, is really brilliant, which is, you're basically bringing video games to life. Exactly. That's exactly right. We literally use that exact same phrase because in the case of Drive, this 
would not have anywhere near the impact, but seeing it physically really stood out. And so effectively we've, with, with drive, we were creating a video game engine for the physical world. Um, and then with Cosmo, we expanded that video game engine to create a character and, and, and uh, uh, kind of an animation and interaction engine on top of it that allowed us to start to create these much more rich experiences. And a lot of those elements were uh, almost like a proving ground for what would human robot interaction feel like in a domain that's much more forgiving, where you can make mistakes in a game. Mm-hmm. It's okay if like, uh, if, you know, a car goes off the track or if, uh, if Cosmo makes a mistake. Um, and what's funny is actually we were so worried about that. Um, in reality, we realized very quickly that those mistakes can be endearing. And if you make a mistake, as long as you realize you make a mistake and have the right emotional reaction to it, it builds even more empathy yeah. with the character. Yeah, that's um, brilliant. Which is- exactly. So when uh, the, the thing you're optimizing for is fun, you have so much more freedom to fail, to explore. Mm-hmm. And, and also in the toy space. chaos from mistakes yeah. and the uh, and so you start to kind of intentionally almost add noise to the system uh in order to kind of create more of a realism in the exact same way the human player might start really ineffective and inefficient and then start to kind of increase their quality bar as they um uh, as they progress and there is a really really aggressive constraint that's forced on you by a, being a consumer product where the price point matters a ton particularly in like kind of an entertainment where um you know, you you can't make a thousand dollar product unless you're going to meet the like the expectations of a thousand dollar product. Mm-hmm. And so, um, in order to make this work, like your cost of goods had to be like like you know well under a hundred dollars. Uh, uh, in the case of Cosmo, we got it under fifty dollars end to end, fully packaged and delivered. And it was under two hundred dollars uh, at retail. The, co- yeah. the cost at retail. Yeah. So uh, uh, okay, if we sit down like at the early stages, if we go back to that. And you're sitting down and thinking about what Cosmo looks like from a yeah. design perspective and from a cost perspective. I imagine that was part of the conversation. Um, I, well, first of all, what came first? Did you have a cost in mind? Is there a target you're trying to chase? Did you have a vision in mind, like size? Did you have, because there's a lot of unique qualities to Cosmo. So for people who don't know, they should definitely check it out. There's a, there's a display, there's eyes on the, the little display, yeah. and those eyes can... It's pretty uh, low resolution eyes, right? But they they still are able to convey a lot of emotion. And there's this arm, like that uh, lift sort uh, of yeah. lift stuff. But there's something about arm. Them are the two treads, which is for basic yes. movement. And so you literally have only a head that goes up and down, yes. a lift that goes up and down, and then your two wheels. Yeah. Uh, and you have sound. Uh, and a screen, yeah. and a low resolution screen, and with that, it's actually pretty incredible what you can uh, what you can come up with. Where, like you said, it's a uh, it's a really interesting give and take because there's a lot of ideas far beyond that. Obviously, as you can imagine, where like you said, how big is it? How much degrees of freedom? What does he look like? Um, uh, what does he sound like? How does he communicate? It's it's a formula that actually scales way beyond entertainment. This is the formula for human r- kind of robot interface more generally is you almost have this triangle between um, the physical aspects of it, the mechanics, the industrial design, what's mass producible, the cost constraints and so forth. Uh, you have the AI side of how do you understand the world around you, interact intelligently with it, execute what you want to execute, so perceive the environment make intelligent decisions and and move forward and then you have the character side of it um most uh companies that have done anything in human robot interaction really uh miss the mark or underinvest in the character side of it mm-hmm. um they overinvest in the mechanical side of it uh you know and then varied results on the ai side of it and so the thinking is that you put more mechanical flexibility into it you're going to do better mm-hmm. um you don't necessarily you actually create a much higher bar uh, for a high ROI because now your price point goes up, your expectations go up, and if the AI can't meet it or the overall experience isn't there, you you miss the mark. Um, so who, like, how did you... 
toy entertainment space, you'll never sell a product over $99. Um, that was fundamentally false and we believed it to be false. It was because the experience had to kind of, you know, meet the mark. Mm -hmm. And so we pushed past that amount, but there was a pressure where the higher you go, the more seasonal you become and the tougher it, it becomes. And so on the cost side, we very quickly partnered up with some previous contacts that we worked with where, just as an example, one our head of mechanical engineering um, was one of the earliest heads of engineering at Logitech and has a billion units of consumer products in circulation <laughs> that he's worked on. Yeah. So like crazy, low cost, high volume consumer product experience. We had a really great mechanical engineering team and just a very practical mindset where we were not going to compromise on feasibility in the market in order to chase something that would be enabler. And we pushed a huge amount of expectations onto the software team where, yes, we're going to use cheap uh, noisy motors and sensors, but we're going to fix it in the, um, on the software side. Then we found on the design and character side, there was a faction that was more from like a game design background that thought that it should be very games driven Cosmo, where you create a whole bunch of games experiences and it's all about like game mechanics. And then there was, um, a, a faction which my my co-founder and I are most involved in this, like really believed in, which was character driven. And the argument is that you will never compete with what you can do virtually from a game standpoint, but you actually, on the character side, put this into your wheelhouse and put it more towards your advantage because a physical character has a massively higher impact uh, physically than virtually. This is, okay, can I just pause on that? Because this yeah. is so brilliant. When I, uh, for people who don't know Cosmo, plays games with you yep. but there's also a depth of character and i actually when i was you know uh, playing with it i wondered exactly what is the compelling aspect of this because to me obviously i'm i'm biased but to me the character yeah. i get what i enjoyed most honestly or what got me to return to it is the character that's right but that's that's a fascinating discussion of uh, you're right Ultimately, you cannot compete on the quality of the gaming experience. It's too restrictive. The physical world is just too restrictive. Yeah. And uh, you don't have a graphics engine. It's like all this. But on the character side, we, uh, and clearly we moved in that direction as like kind of the, 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 the winning path. And um, we partnered up with this uh, really, we immediately like went towards Pixar and Carlos Bana, he was um, one of, like, had been at Pixar for nine years. He'd worked on tons of the movies, including Wally and others, and just immediately kind of spoke the language and it just clicked on how you think about that, like, kind of magic and drive. And then he, we built out a team, uh, you know, with him as, like, a really kind of prominent kind of driver of this with different types of backgrounds and animators and character developers where um, we put these constraints on the team but then got them to really try to create magic despite that. And we converged on this system that was at the overlap of character and the character AI that where if you imagine the dimensionality of emotions, happy, sad, angry, surprised, confused, uh, um, scared, like you think of these extreme emotions, um, uh, we almost like kind of put this challenge to kind of populate this library of responses on how do you show the extreme uh, response that like goes to the extreme spectrum. Randomness to them where you could have infinite permutations of happy and surprised and so forth. Um, and then we had a behavioral engine that took the context from the real world and would interpret it and then create kind of probability mappings on what sort of responses you would have that actually made sense. And so if Cosmo saw you for the first time in a day, um, he'd be really surprised and happy in the same way that the first time you walk in and like your toddler sees you, they're so happy, but they're not going to be that happy for the entirety of your right. next two hours. But like you have this like spike in response, or if you leave him alone for too long, he gets bored and starts causing trouble and like nudging things off the table. Yeah. Um, or if you beat him in a game, um, the most enjoyable emotions are him getting frustrated and grumpy yeah. to a point where our, our testers and our customers would be like, I had to let him win because I don't want him to be upset. Yeah. And, uh, 
And so you, you <laughs> start awesome. to like create this feedback loop where you see how powerful those emotions are. And just to give you an example, something as simple as eye contact, um, you don't think about it in a movie, just like it kind of happens like, you know, camera angles and so forth. Um, but that's not really a prominent source of interaction. What happens when a physical character like Cosmo, when he makes eye contact with you, um, it built universal kind of connection, kids all the way through adults. Um, and it was truly universal. It was not like people stopped caring after 10, 12 years old. Um, and so... Uh, even thought that it would be amazing if like, you know, they're like you know, like their characters actually help them be, have strengths and weaknesses and some, you know, like whatever they end up doing, like some are scared, some are, you know, uh, arrogant, some are, uh, you know, super warm and like uh, kind of friendly. And in the end, we focused on one because it made it very clear that, we, hey, we got to build out enough depth here because you're yeah. kind of trying to expand. It's almost like how long can you maintain a fiction that this character is alive? Mm -hmm. Um, to where the person's explorations don't hit a boundary, um, which happens almost immediately with with typical toys, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know even with video games, uh, how long can we create that immersive experience to where you expand the boundary? And one of the things we realized is that you're um, just way more forgiving when something uh, has a personality and it's physical. Um, that is the key uh, that unlocks. Uh, robotics interacting you know in the physical world and more generally is that that uh the when you have a when you don't have a personality and you make a mistake as a robot the stupid robot make it made a mistake why is it not perfect when you have a character and you make a mistake you have empathy and it becomes endearing and you're way more forgiving and that was the key that was like i think goes far far beyond entertainment it uh actually builds the depth of the personality the mistakes so let me ask the the movie her question then how and so cosmos seem feels like the early days of something that will obviously be prevalent throughout society at a scale that we cannot even imagine my sense is it seems obvious that these kinds of characters will permeate society and that we'll be friends with them we'll be interacting with them in different ways in the way we i mean you don't think of it this way but when you play video games, they're kind they're often cold and impersonal. But but even then, uh you think about role playing games, you become friends with certain characters in that game. Yeah. They're they don't remember much about you. They they they're they're just telling a story. It's it's yeah. exactly what you're saying. They they exist in that virtual world. But if they acknowledge that you exist in this physical world, if the characters in the game remember that you exist that you like for me like yeah. lex they understand that i'm a human being who has like hopes and dreams and so on it seems like there's going to be a like billions if not trillions of cosmos in the world so if we look at that future there's several questions to ask how intelligent does that future cosmo need to be to create fulfilling relationships like friendships yeah it's, it's a great question and and part of it was a recognition that it's going to take time to get there because it has to be a lot more intelligent um because what's good enough to be a magical experience for uh you know an eight-year-old um it's a higher bar to do that be a on that and you kind of get there and as technology becomes more prevalent and less expensive and so forth you can start to kind of work up to it um but you know you're absolutely right at the end of the day um we almost equated it to how uh the touchscreen created like this really novel interface to you know physical kind of devices like this this is the extension of it where you have much richer physical interaction in the real world this is this is the enabler for it um and it shows itself in a few kind of really obvious places so just take something as simple as a voice assistant um you will never most people will never tolerate uh an alexa or a google home just starting a conversation um proactively uh when you weren't kind of expecting it because if it, it feels weird it's like you were listening and like and then now you're kind of it, it feels intrusive but <laughs> In general, um, 
you know, it, there's a lot of ways to customize it, but it makes people who are skeptical of technology much more comfortable with it. There was like, there were a couple of really, really prominent examples of this. So when we launched in Europe, and so we were in, um, uh, I think like a do dozen countries, if I remember correctly, but like we were, we went pretty aggressively in, la uh, in launching in um, Germany and France and uh, in UK. And we were very worried in Europe because there's obviously like a really, a socially higher bar for privacy and, sec you know, security where you, you've heard about how many companies have had troubles on, uh, uh, that might have things that might have been okay in the U.S., but like are just not okay in Germany and France in particular. Um, and so we were worried about this because you have, um, you know, Cosmo, who's um, uh, you know, in in our, in our future product vector, like where you have cameras, you have microphones, it's cloud connected, and like you're playing with kids and mm -hmm. like in in these experiences, uh, and you're like, this is like ripe to be like a nightmare if you're not careful. Yes. Um, and. Uh, and the journalists are like notoriously like really really tough on on these sort of things. Um, we were shocked, and we prepared so much for what we would have to encounter. We were shocked in that not once from any journalists or customer did we have any complaints beyond like a really casual kind of question. And it was because the, of the character where um, when the conversation came up, um, it was almost like well. Society and uh, and a potential building block of future experiences. So, if you look out into the future, do you think we will have beyond a particular game, you know, a companion like uh, like her, like the movie Her, or like a Cosmo that's kind of asks you how your day went too, right? Yeah. You know, like a friend. Yeah. Do, do you, how how many years away from that do you think we are? What's your intuition? Good question. So, I think the idea of a different type of character, like more closer to like kind of a pet style companionship, yes, will come yeah. way faster. Um, and there's a few reasons. One is like to to do something like in her, that's like all effectively almost general. AI and the bar is so high that if you miss it by a bit, you hit the uncanny valley where it just becomes creepy and like and not um, not, not appealing um, because the closer you try to get to a human in form and interface and voice, the harder it becomes. Whereas you have way more flexibility on still landing a really great experience if you embrace the idea of a character, and that's why um, one of the other reasons why we didn't have a voice. Uh, and also why, like, a lot of video games. And you also said that it requires general intelligence to be a successful participant in a relationship, which could explain why I'm single. This this very... <laughs> but the I, I honestly want to push back on that a little bit because I feel like, is it possible that if you're just good at playing a character... You in, in in a movie, there's a bunch of characters. Right. If you just understand what creates compelling characters, and then you you just are that character, and you exist in the world, and other people find you and they connect with you, just like you do yeah. when you talk to somebody at a bar. I like this character. This character is kind of shady. I don't like them. You pick the ones that you like, and you know maybe it's somebody that's uh, reminds you of your fa father or mother. I don't know what it is, but the, the, the Freudian thing, but th there's some kind of connection that happens. And that's, that, that's the Cosmo you connect to. That's yeah. the future Cosmo you connect. And that's, so, so I guess the statement I'm... That expectations and constraints such that in the space that's left, you can be successful. And so you can do that by having a very focused domain that you can operate in. For example, you're a customer support agent for a particular product right. and you create intelligence and a good interface around that. Or, uh, you know, kind of in the personal companionship side, you can't be everything to across the board. You you kind of solve those constraints. And I think uh, I think it's possible. My my worry is I, like I, right now I don't see anybody that has picked up on where kind of Cosmo left off yes. and is pushing on it in the same way. And so I don't know if it's a sort of thing where similar to like how, you know, in .com there were all these concepts that we considered like 
you know, that didn't work out or like failed or like were too early or whatnot. And then 20 years later, you have these like incredible successes on almost the same concept. Like it might be that sort of thing where like there's another pass at it that happens in five years or in 10 years. But um, it does feel like that appreciation of that, like the, the, the three-legged stool, if you will, between like, you know, the hardware, the AI and the character, um, that balance, it's hard to, I'm not aware of of any pro, anywhere right now where like that same kind of aggressive drive with the value on the character is uh, is happening. And so, to me, just a prediction, exactly as you said, something that looks awfully a lot like Cosmo, not in the actual physical form, but in the three legged stool, something like that. In some number of years, will be a trillion dollar company. I don't understand. Like it's obvious to me yeah. that like character not just as robotic companions but in all our computers they'll be there it's like uh clippy was like two legs of that stool or something like that yeah i mean that those are all different attempts and what what's really confusing to me is they they're born these attempts and they they everybody gets excited and for some reason they die Mm -hmm. and then nobody else tries to pick it up and then maybe a few years later, a, a crazy guy like you comes comes around with just enough brilliance and vision to create this thing, and is born. A lot of people love it. A lot of people get excited, but maybe the timing is not right yet. Yeah. And then, and then when the timing is right, it just blows yeah. up. It just keeps blowing up more and more until it just blows up and. I guess everything in the right. full span of human civilization collapses eventually. Yeah. But. <laughs> and that, that wouldn't surprise me at all. And like, what's going to be different in another five years or 10 years or whatnot? Physical component costs will continue to come down uh, in price. And, you know, mobile devices and computation is going to become more and more prevalent as well as cloud as a, as a big tool uh, to offload cost. Um, AI is going to be a massive transformation compared to what we dealt with, uh, mm -hmm. where um, everything from voice understanding to um, uh, to just you know kind of a broader contextual uh, understanding and mapping of uh, of semantics and uh, understanding scenes and so forth. And then the character side will continue to kind of you know progress as well because that magic does exist; it just exists in different forms. Um, and you have just the brilliance of uh, uh, the tapping and animation, and, and you know these other areas where um, that is that was a big unlock in um, you know in film, obviously. Uh, and so I think yeah, the pieces can reconnect, and the building blocks are actually going to be way more impressive than they were five years ago. So, so in two thousand nineteen. Uh, Anki, the company that created Cosmo, the company that you started had to shut down. How did you feel at that time? Yeah, it was tough. Uh, that was a really emotional stretch and it was pr really tough year. Like about a year uh, ahead of that was actually a pretty brutal stretch because we were um, kind of light, life or death on many, many moments, um, just navigating these insane kind of just ups and downs and um, barriers. And the thing that made it like, um, like just, just rewinding a tiny bit, like what, you know, what ended up being really challenging about it as a business where is um, from a commercial standpoint and customer reception standpoint, there's a lot of things you could point to that were like, you know, pretty big successes, sold millions of units, uh, like, you know, got to like pretty serious revenue, like kind of close to a hundred million annual revenue, um, uh, number one kind of product in kind of various categories, but it was pretty expensive. It ended up being very seasonal where something like 85% of our volume was in Q4 um, because it was a, you know, a present and, and it was expensive to market it and explain it and so forth. Um, and even though, though the volume was like really sizable and like the reviews were really fantastic, um, forecasting and planning for it and managing the cash operations was just brutal. Like it was absolutely brutal. You don't think about this when you're starting a company or when you have a few million in, you know, in, in revenue, because it's just your biggest costs are kind of just your headcount and operations and everything's ahead of you. But we got to a point where we 
I was very transparent with the company, like in the, the team while we were going through it, where actually, despite how challenging that period was, very few people left. I mean, like people loved the vision, the team, the culture of the like kind of chemistry and kind of what we were doing. There was just a huge amount of pride there. And then we wanted to see it through. And we felt like we had a shot to kind of get through these checkpoints. Um, we ended up, uh, and I mean, by brutal, I mean like literally like days of cash, like three, four different times uh, runway, like in the year, you know, kind of before it, um, where you're like playing games of chicken on negotiating credit line timelines and like repayment uh, terms and how to get like a bridge loan from an investor. It's just like yeah. level of stress that like is as hard as things might be anywhere else. Like mm-hmm. it, you'll never come, you know, come close to that where you feel that like responsibility for, you know, 200 plus people. Right. Um, and so we were very transparent during our fundraise on who we're talking to, the challenges um, that we have, how it's going and when things are going well, when things were tough. Um, and so it wasn't a complete shock when it happened, but it was just very emotional where like I, you know, like, you know, when we announced it finally that like, um, you know, we, you know, basically were just like watching kind of like, you know, the runway and trying to kind of time it. And when we realized that like we didn't have any more outs, we wanted to like kind of wind it down, make sure that it was like clean and, you know, we could like kind of take care of people the best we could. But yeah, like broke down crying at all, you know, hands and some of you know. <laughs> And products and the team that um uh you know there's there's a lot there that like in the you know right context could have been uh pretty incredible but it was um emotional just yeah just thinking i mean just looking at this company like you said the product and technology but the vision the implementation you got the cost down very low yeah. And the, the compelling, the nature of the product was great. So many robotics companies failed at this. At they, the, the robot was too expensive. It didn't have the personality. It didn't really provide any value, like a sufficient value to justify the price. So like you, you succeeded where basically every single other robotics company, or most of them that are like going in the category of social robotics have kind of failed. And I mean, it's um, it's it's quite tragic. I remember uh, what is going to succeed because that yeah. to me was incredible. Like it, 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 it was an incredible idea. Cost is down. The minimum. The the the. It's just like the most minimal design in physical form that you could do. It's really compelling. The balance of games, so it's, it's a it's a fun toy. It's a great gift for all kinds of age groups, right? Yeah. It's just it's, it's compelling in every single way, and it seemed like uh, it was a, a huge success. And it, it it failing was, I don't know. There was heartbreak on many levels for me, just as an external observer. Is I was thinking, how hard is it to run a business? <laughs> that's that's what I was thinking. Oh. Like, if this, there will be companies, uh, maybe Waymo and uh, Google will be somehow involved that will carry this flag forward and will uh, will make you proud, whether you're involved or not. kind of kept big chunks of the team together and we actually kind of helped align this, uh, mm-hmm. um, you know, to, to help people out as well. Um, and one of them was Waymo where uh, a majority of the AI and robotics team mm-hmm. actually had the exact background uh, that you would look for in like kind of AV space. And it was mm-hmm. a space that a lot of us like, you know, were, you know, worked on in grad school, were always passionate about and ended up, uh, no, maybe the time you know ser- serendipitous timings from another perspective, where like uh, um, kind of landed in a really unique um, circumstance. It's actually been quite exciting too. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting to ask you just your thoughts. Uh, Cosmo still lives on under Dream Labs. I, I think uh, yeah. is that. Are you tracking the progress there, or is it too much pain? <laughs> uh, is it? Yeah. Are you? Is that something that you're excited to see where that goes? So, keeping an eye on it, of course, just out of your curiosity, and obviously, just kind of care for product line. I think um, 
it's deceptive how complex it is to manufacture and evolve that product line. Um, and the amount of experiences that are required to complete the picture and be able to move that forward. And I think that's going to make it pretty hard to do something really sub substantial with it. It would be cool if like even the product in the way it was, was able to be manufactured. Yes. Uh, you know, again, that would- Which understand. is the current goal, I suppose. Yeah, which would be neat. Um, but uh, it's, I, I think uh, it was, it's deceptive how tricky that is on like everything from the quality control, the details and, um, and then like technology changes that forces you to Rick reinvent and update certain things. Um, so uh, I haven't been super close to it, but just kind of keeping an eye on it. That show is. And obviously I think in season one is where the butter robot comes along for just a few minutes or whatever. But I just fell in love with the butter robot. The sort of the, that particular character, just like you said, there's characters you can create, personalities you can create. And that particular a robot who's doing a particular task realizes, you know, this like realize ask the existential question this the myth of sisyphus question that uh camus writes about it's like th is this all there is is he moves butter but you know <laughs> that realization yeah. that's a be that's a beautiful little realization for a robot that i my purpose is very limited, limited to this particular yeah. task <laughs> it's a be it's it's humor of course it's darkness it's a beautiful mix but so they want to or at least that butter robot, but something tells me that to do the same depth of personality as Cosmo had, the same richness, it would be on the manufacturing, on the AI, on the storytelling, on the design, it's going to be very, very difficult. It could be a cool sort of uh, toy for Rick and Morty fans, but to yeah. create the same depth of, Ex existential angst yeah that the butter robot symbolizes is, is is really that's the brave effort with communication the personality storytelling all those kinds of things um i think i understand the process of that but how do you know when you got it right so with with cosmo how did you know this is great, like, or mm, something is off. Like, yeah, is this brainstorming with the team? Do you know it when you see it? Is it like love at first sight? It's like, this is right. Or like, I guess if we think of it as an optimization space, is there uncanny valley where you're like, that's not right, or this is right, or are a lot of characters right? Yeah. We stayed away from uncanny valley just by having such a different, what, like mapping where it didn't try to look like a dog or a human or anything like that. And so uh, y you avoided having like a weird pseudo similarity, but not quite hitting the mark. Um, but you could like just fall flat where just like a personality or a char you know, character emotion just didn't feel right. And so it actually mirrored very closely to kind of the iterations that a character director at Pixar would have where you're running through it and you can virtually kind of like see what it'll look like. We we created a plugin to where we actually used like like Maya the simu you know the <laughs> animation tools and then we created a plugin that perfectly ma matched it nice. uh, to the physical one and so you could like test it out virtually and then push a button and see it physically play out and there's like subtle differences and so you want to like make sure that that feedback loop is super easy mm -hmm. to be able to test it live um, and then sometimes like you would just. <laughs> does it truly kind of feel magical? And so mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, we just give a lot of um, autonomy to the character team to really think about the, you know, character board and mood boards and storyboards and like what's the background of this character and how would they react? Um, and they went through a process that's actually pretty familiar, but now had to operate under these unique constraints. Um, but the moment where it felt right, um, kind of took a fairly similar journey than like a, as a character in an animated film, actually. It's quite cool. Well, the the thing that's really important to me, and I wonder if it's possible, well, I hope it's possible, pretty sure it's possible, is for me, even though... We could 
could get statistics on how much of that space we were saturating um, and then add more animations and more diversity in the places it would get hit more often so that you stay ahead of the, um, you know, the, the curve and maximize the, uh, the chance that it, it stays feeling alive. Um, and so, but then when you like combine it, like the permutations and kind of like the combinations of emotions stitched together sometimes surprised us because you see them in isolation, but when you actually see them and you see them live, you know, relative mm -hmm. to some event that happened in the game or whatnot, like it was kind of cool to see the combination of the two. And, um, uh, and not too different in other robotics applications where like you get, you get so used to thinking about like the modules of a system and mm -hmm. how things progress through a tech stack mm -hmm. that, the real magic is when all the pieces come together and you start getting the right emergent behavior um, in a way that's easy to lose when you just kind of go too deep into mm -hmm. any one piece of it. Yeah, when the system is sufficiently complex, there is something like emergent behavior and that's where the magic is. You, as a human being, you can still appreciate the beauty of that magic of yeah. the fine, at the system level. First of all, thank you for humoring me on this. Uh, it's really, really... Uh, fascinating. I think a lot of people would love this. I, I'd love to just, one last thing on the butter robot, I promise. So right now there is no speech system that is like rich enough and, and subtly real, realistic enough to feel appropriate. Um, and so we very, very quickly kind of like moved away from it. Now, speech understanding is a different matter where understanding intent, that's a really valuable input um but giving it back requires like a you know way way higher bar um given kind of where today's um uh world is and so uh that realization that you can do surprisingly much with uh either no speech or, or kind of tonal like the way you know wally r2d2 and kind of other characters are able to um it's uh, quite powerful and it generalizes um across cultures and across ages really really well I think we're going to be in that world for a little while where it's still very much an unsolved problem on how to like make something. It touches on the uncanny valley thing. So if you have legs and you're a big humanoid looking thing, you have very different expectations and a much narrower degree of what's going to be acceptable by mm -hmm. society than if you're a uh, you know, robot like uh, like Cosmo or Wally and you can, or some other form where you can kind of like reinvent the, the character. Speech has that same property where speech is so well understood um, in terms of expectations by humans that you have far less flexibility on how to deviate from that and, and lean into your strengths and avoid weaknesses. But I wonder if there is, obviously there is certain kinds of speech that uh, activates the uncanny. A robot that doesn't know English and is learning English, right? Yeah, yeah. Those kinds of personalities. A fiction where you're like, uh, you're intentionally kind of like getting a toddler level of uh, yeah. speech. So that, that's exactly right. So you can have like, uh, tie it into the experience where uh, it is a more limited character or you embrace the lack of emotions as part, or the lack of, sorry, dynamic range in the right. speech kind of capabilities, emotions as like part of the character itself. And you've that's, seen that in like kind of fictional characters as well. Yeah. Um, but that's why uh, this podcast works. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, and you kind of had that with like, um, I don't know, I guess. NLP perspective, <laughs> like there's certain aspects. So if you modify human behavior, like so, so, so forget the sort of artificial thing where you don't know English toddler thing. We, if you just look at the full range of humans, I think we, there's certain situations where we put up with a uh, like lower level of intelligence in our communication. Like if somebody's drunk, we understand the situ that they're probably under the influence. Like we understand that they're not going to be making any sense. Anger is another one like that. I'm sure there's a lot of other kind of situations the like high, this. Yeah. Maybe, uh, yeah, again, language, loss in translation, that kind of stuff that I think if you, if you play with that, uh, what is it, the Ukrainian boy that passed the touring test, you know, play with those ideas. I think that's really interesting. And then you can create compelling characters. But you're right, that's a dangerous sort of road to walk because uh, you're adding degrees of freedom that can get you in trouble. Yeah, and that's why, like, you have these um, big pushes that, like, for most of the last decade plus, like, where you'd have, like, 
full like hu- human replicas of robots, really being down to like skin and yeah. like kind of in some places. Um, I'm like, I'm th- my, my 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 personal feeling is like, man, like that's not the direction that's most fruitful right now. Right. Um, uh, Beautiful art, yeah. Right? It's not in terms of a uh, uh, rich, deep, fulfilling experience. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and uh, away creating a minefield of potential places to feel off. Uh, yeah. uh, and then and then you're sidestepping where like the biggest kind of functional AI challenges are to actually have you know, kind of like really rich productivity that actually kind of justifies a, you know, kind of the higher price points. And that's, that's part of the challenge is like, yeah, like robots are going to get to like thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars and so forth. But you can imagine what sort of expectation of value that comes with it. Um, and so that's where you want to be able to invest the, the, uh, distraction and really, really high bar that can end up sucking up so much of your resources. So it's weird to say, but you happen to be one of the greatest at this point roboticists ever because you created uh, this little guy. You were part, obviously, of a great team that created the the little guy with a deep personality and are now switching to an entirely, well, maybe not entirely, but a different fascinating, impactful robotics problem, which is autonomous driving, and more specifically, the biggest version of autonomous driving, which is autonomous trucking. So you are at Waymo now. Can you give us a big picture overview? What is Waymo? What is Waymo Driver? What is Waymo One? What is Waymo Via? Can you give an overview of the company and the vision behind the company? For sure. Waymo, by the way, is just has been eye opening on just how incredible that uh, the people and the talent is, and how in one company you almost have to create I don't know thirty companies worth of like <laughs> technology and capability to like kind of solve the full spectrum of it. So, um, yeah, so I've, I've been at Waymo since um, 2019, so about two and a half years. So Waymo is uh, focused on building what we call a driver, which is uh, creating the ability to have autonomous driving across different environments, vehicle platforms, domains, and use cases. Uh, you know, as you know, it got started in uh, uh, 2009. It was a lot, uh, almost like an immediate successor to the Grand Challenge and Urban Challenges that were like incredible uh, kind of catalysts for this whole space. Um, and so Google started this project and then eventually Waymo spun out. And so what Waymo is doing is creating uh, the systems, both you know, hardware, software, infrastructure, and everything that goes into it to enable and to commercialize autonomous driving. This hits on consumer transportation and ride sharing and kind of vehicles and urban environments. Um, and as you mentioned, it hits on autonomous trucking to, uh, to transport um, goods. So in a lot of ways, it's transporting people and transporting goods. Um, but at the end of the day, the underlying capabilities are required to do that are surprisingly better aligned than one might expect, um, where it's the fundamentals of um, of being able to a set of sensors that perceive the world can act in that world and move this whatever the vehicle the pl- is yeah, through vehicle the world. Platform. That's right. And so in the same way that you have a driver's license and like your ability to drive is <laughs> yeah. tied to a particular make. Which is the trucking component? Why Via, by the way? What is that? What is that? What's is it? Just like a cool sounding name that just yeah. Uh, well, like, is there is there an interesting story there? Just it is a pretty cool sounding name. It's a cool sounding name. I mean, when you think about it, it's just like well, we're gonna transport it via this and that. And oh, that. Cool. Like so, yeah, it's just cool. kind of like an allusion to um, the mechanics of transporting something. Yes, cool. Um, and, uh, and it is a pretty good grouping. And the interesting thing is that even the groupings kind of blur where Waymo one is like human transportation. And, uh, there's a fully autonomous service in the Phoenix area that like every day is transporting people. And it's pretty incredible to like, just, see, you know, see that operate at reasonably large scale and just kind of happen. And then on the via side, it doesn't even have to be like long haul trucking is a like a, a major focus of uh, of ours. But down the road, you can stitch together the 
is, is that there's a huge amount of leverage and this kind of core technology stack now gets pushed on by both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and that adds its own unique challenges, but the success case is that um, the challenges that you push on, um, they get leveraged across all platforms and all so domains. The, the, from an engineer perspective, the teams are integrated. It's a mix. So there's a huge amount of centralized kind of core teams that support all applications. And so you think of something like the hardware team that develops the lasers, the compute, yeah. integrates into vehicle platforms. This is an experience that carries over across um, you know any application that we'd have, and they have been full with both. Then there's like really unique um, perception challenges, planning challenges, like other you know types of challenges where there's a huge amount of leverage on a core tech stack, but then there's like dedicated teams that think of how do you deal with a unique challenge? For example, um, an articulated trailer with varying loads that completely changes the physical dynamics of a vehicle. That doesn't exist on a car, but becomes one of the most important um, kind of unique new challenges on a, on a truck. So what's the long-term dream of Waymo via uh, the autonomous trucking effort that Waymo is doing? Yeah, so we're starting with developing uh, L4 autonomy for um, Class 8 trucks. These are 53-foot trailers that uh, capture like a big, a pretty sizable percentage of the goods transportation in the country. Um, Long-term, the opportunity is obviously to expand to much more diverse types of vehicles, uh, types of good transportation, and start to really expand in both the volume and the route feasibility that's possible. And so just like we did on the car side, you start with a single route with a very specific operating kind of domain and constraints that allow you to solve the problem. But then over time, you start to really try to push uh, against those boundaries and open up deeper feasibility across routes across surface streets, across environmental conditions, across the type of goods that you carry, the versatility of those goods, and how little supervision is necessary to just start to scale this network. And long term, there's actually, it's a pretty incredible enabler where, um, you know, today you have already a giant shortage of truck drivers. It's uh, over 80,000 truck driver shortage that's expected to grow to hundreds of thousands in the years ahead you have really, really quickly increasing demand from e-commerce and just, just distribution of uh, where people are located. Um, you have one of the uh, deepest safety challenges of, um, of any profession in the U.S. where um, there's a, a huge, huge, huge kind of challenge around fatigue and around... <laughs> cost and driving fuel insurance and safety standpoint, all the way to completely reinventing the logistics network um, across the United States and enabling something completely different than what it looks like today. Yeah, I had uh, uh, be published before this, had a great conversation with Steve Vicelli, who we talked about the manual driving, and he echoed many of the same things that you were talking about, but we talked about much of the the fascinating human stories of truck drivers. Uh, he was also was a truck driver for 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 a bit yeah. as, a, as a grad student to try to understand the depth of the problem. It's, it's a fascinating, fascinating lives. Uh, we have some drivers that have four million miles of lifetime driving yeah. experience. It's uh, pretty incredible, and um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, learning from them. Like some of them are on the road for three hundred days a year. It's um, very unique type of lifestyle. So there's fascinating stuff there. Just like you said, there's a shortage of actually uh, people uh, truck drivers. Uh, taking the job counter to what this I think is publicly believed yeah. um, uh, so there's an excess of jobs and a shortage of people to take up those jobs and just like you said it's such a difficult problem and these are experts at driving at solving this particular problem and it's fascinating to learn from them to understand you know how hard is this problem and that's the question I want to ask you from a perception, from a robotics perspective. What's your sense of how difficult is, a, is autonomous trucking? Maybe you can comment on which scenarios are super difficult, which are more manageable. Is there is there a way to kind of convert into words how difficult the problem is? Yeah, it's a very good question. So there's, um, and as you can expect, it's a mix. Some things become a lot uh, uh a lot easier or at least more flexible 
um, some things are harder. And so, you know, on, on the things that are like uh, the tailwinds, the benefits, um, a big focus of auto automating trucking, especially initially, is really focusing on the long haul freeway stretch of it, mm -hmm. um, where that's where a majority of the value is captured. On a freeway, you have a lot more structure and a lot more consistency across freeways across the U.S. Um, compared to surface streets where you have a way higher dimensionality of what can happen, lack of structure, lack of consistency and variability across cities. So you can leverage that consistency to um, tackle, at least in that respect, a more constrained AI problem, which has some benefits to it. Um, you can itemize much more of the sort of things you might encounter and so forth. And so uh, those are benefits. Is there a canonical freeway and city we should be thinking about like do, is there is there a standard thing that's brought up in conversation often like here's a stretch of road uh consumer transportation and ride sharing you know kind of economy a big percentage of that market is captured in the densest cities in the United States and so really pushing at and solving San Francisco becomes a really huge opportunity and uh importance and um and you know places one dot on kind of like the spectrum of like kind of complexity uh, the Phoenix area, starting with Chandler and then like kind of expanding more broadly in the Phoenix uh, metropolitan area, it's, uh, I believe, the fastest growing city in the U.S. It's a uh, kind of a higher medium-sized city, but growing quickly um, and still captures a really wide range of kind of like complexities. And so getting to driverless there actually exposes you to a lot of the building blocks you need for the more complicated environments. And so... In a lot of ways, there's a thesis that if you start to kind of place a few of these kind of dots where San Francisco has these types of unique challenges, dense pedestrians, all this like complexity, mm -hmm. especially when you get into the downtown areas and so forth. And Phoenix has like a, a really interesting kind of spectrum of challenges. Maybe, in, you know, other ones like LA kind of add freeway focus and so forth. You start to kind of cover the full set of features that you might expect and it becomes faster and faster if you have the right systems and the right organization to then open up the fifth city and the 10th city and the 20th city. On trucking, there's uh, similar properties where um, obviously there's uniquenesses in freeways when you get into really dense environments. And then uh, the real opportunity uh, to then, you know, get even more uh, value is to think about how you expand with like some of the service street challenges. But for example, right now we're looking, um, we have a big facility that we're uh, finishing building in Q1 in uh, Dallas area. Um, that'll allow us to do testing from the Dallas area on routes like Dallas to Houston, Dallas to Phoenix, um, going out east. and Dallas to Austin? Uh, Austin, so that triangle. Um, Waymo should come to Austin. <laughs> well, Waymo, the car side, was in Austin for a while. Yes, I know. Yeah. But come back. <laughs> yeah, but uh, trucking is actually, Texas is one of the best places to start uh, yeah. because of both volume, regulatory, weather, there's a lot of benefits. Um on trucking, a huge opportunity is Port of LA going east. So mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, a lot of the work is to start to... It means, but for you, what does the level four mean? And you mentioned freeway. Let's say like there's three parts of long haul trucking. Maybe I'm wrong in this, but there's freeway driving. There's like truck stop. And then there's more urban-y type yeah. of area. So which of those do you want to tackle? Which of them do you include under level four? Like, well, how do you think about this problem? What do you focus on? Where's the biggest impact to be had in the short term? Yeah. So the goal is to, we got, we got to get to market as fast as we can, because the moment you get to market, you just learn so much and it influences everything that you do. And it is... Um, uh, I mean, one of the experiences that carried over from before is that you add constraints, you figure out the right compromises, you do whatever it takes because getting to market like is so critical, right? And but here, uh, with autonomous um, driving, you can get to market in so many different ways. That's too. right. And so, one of the simplify simplifications that we intentionally have put on is using what we call transfer hubs, where you can imagine depots uh, that are. Uh, at the entry points to metropolitan areas, like let's say Dallas, cool. like the hub that we're building, which does a few things that are very valuable. So from a first product standpoint, you can automate transfer hub to transfer hub. And that path from the transfer hub 
to the you know the full freeway route can be a very intentional single route that you can you think about the flow of people goods everything it's like it's quite cool and it's uh, really beautiful on how it was thought through and so early on it is totally reasonable to do the last five miles manually to get to the final kind of depot to avoid having to solve the general surface street problem which is obviously very complex now when the time comes and we are increasingly well, already we're pushing on some of this but we will increasingly be pushing on surface street capabilities to build out the value chain to go all the way depot to depot instead of transfer hub to transfer hub and we have probably the best advantages in the world because of all the waymo experience mm-hmm. on surface streets but that's not the highest ROI right now where the highest ROI hub is to hub. hub to hub and get the routes going. And so when you ask what's L4, L4 can be applied to any domain, operating domain or scope, but it's effectively for the places where we say we're ready for autonomous operation. We are 100% operating uh, with, uh, through the as a self-driving truck with no... Uh, human behind the wheel. Mm-hmm. That is L4 autonomy. And it doesn't mean that you operate in every condition. It doesn't mean you operate on every road. But for a particularly well-defined area, uh, operating conditions, routes, kind of domain, you are fully autonomous. And that's the difference between L4 and L5. And most people would agree that at least any time in the foreseeable future, L5 is just not even really worth thinking about because there's always going to be these extremes. Um, and so it's a race and a almost like a game where you think of what is the sequence of expanded capabilities that create the most value and teach us the most and create this feedback loop where we're building out and unlocking more and more capability over time. I got to ask you, just curious. So first of all, I have to, when I'm allowed visit the Dallas facility because it's super cool. So it's like robot on the giving and the receiving end. It's the truck is a robot and the the hub is a robot. Yeah, it's got to be it. very robot friendly. So yeah, uh, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> I will feel at home. Uh, the What's the sensor suite like on the hub, if you can just high level mention it? is the, Does the hub have like LIDARs and like... Is is it is the truck doing most of the intelligence, or is the hub also intelligent? Yeah, so most of it will be the truck, and uh, everything is like connected. Like so, we and so you don't actually uh, need to. Um, uh, there might be special cases where that is valuable to equip some sensors um, in the hub, but a majority of the intelligence is going to be on the truck because um, whatever is relevant to the truck. Uh, relevant should be seen by the truck and can be relayed um, uh, remotely for any sort of kind of cognizance or decision making. But there, there's a distinct type of workflow where um, how, where do you check trucks? Where do you want them to enter? What if there's many operating at once? Where's the staging area to depart? How do you set up the flow of humans and human cars and traffic? <laughs> But um, the goal is to um, now. There might be circumstances where it makes sense to have a human, or right. uh, and and obviously these trucks can also be manually driven. So sometimes, like our, we talk with our fleet partners about how um, you can buy a Waymo equipped Daimler truck down the road, and on the routes that are autonomous, it's autonomous. On the routes that are not, it's um, human driven. Maybe there's L2 functionality that adds safety systems and so forth. But as soon as they become, as soon as we expand in software, the availability of driverless routes, the hardware is forward compatible to just now start using them um, in uh, real time. And so you can imagine uh, this mixed use, but at the end of the day, the largest value proposition is where you're um, able to have no constraints on how you can operate this truck. Um, and it's 100% autonomous with nobody inside. Oh, that's amazing. So the um, let me ask on the logistics front, because you mentioned that also opportunity to revamp or for build from scratch some of the ideas around logistics. I don't want to throw too much shade, but from talking to Steve, my understanding is logistics is not perhaps as great as it could be in the current uh, trucking uh, environment. I'm not, maybe you can break down why, but there's probably competing companies. There's just a mess. Maybe some of it is literally just, it's old school. Like they, it's just like 
it's not computer it's not computerized like uh, truckers are almost like contractors there there's an independence and there's not a nice interface where they can communicate where they're going where they're at all, all you know all those kinds of things and so there it just feels like there's so much opportunity to digitize everything to where you could optimize the use of human time optimize the use of all kinds of resources how much are you thinking about that problem how fascinating is that problem how difficult is it how much opportunity is there to revolutionize the space of logistics in autonomous trucking in trucking period it's pretty fascinating it's uh this is one of the most motivating aspects of all this where like yes there's like a mountain of problems that are like you want to you have to solve to get to like the first checkpoints and first drivers and so forth mm -hmm. and inevitably like in a space like this you plug in initially into the existing kind of system and start to kind of you know learn and iterate but um, that opportunity is massive. And so, you know, a couple of the factors that um, play into it. So first of all, um, there's obviously just the physical constraints of driving time, driver availability. Some fleets have a 95% attrition rate, you know, right now because of just this demands and like, you know, kind of gaps in competition and so forth. And then it's also incredibly fragmented where... <laughs> that's captured by the top 10 or 50 fleets is surprisingly small. Mm -hmm. um, the average kind of uh, truck operation is like a one to five truck, you know, family business. Um, <laughs> and so and so there's just like a huge amount of like fragmentation, which makes for um, really interesting challenges in kind of stitching together through like bulletin boards and brokerages and f some people run their own fleets. And, and this world's kind of like evolving um, but uh, it is one of the less digitized um, and optimized worlds that there is. Um, and the part that is optimized is optimized to the constraints of today. Mm -hmm. um, and even within the constraints of today, this is a $900 billion industry in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, the human-driven, like there's so much opportunity to... Uh, significantly improve the human yeah. driven trucking, the timing, the logistics. So you use yeah. humans optimally. The handoffs, the like, the, yeah. you know, well, even that you, I mean, you get really ambitious. You start to expand this beyond like, how does the uh, fulfillment center work? And like, right. how does the transfer hub work? How does the warehouse work to, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities to start to automate these chains. And um, a lot of the inefficiency today is because like you have a delay, like, Port of LA has a bunch of uh, ships. There's a big backlog of deliveries, which means the drivers aren't where they need to be. And so you have this like huge chain reaction and your feasibility of readjusting in this network is low because everything's tied to humans and manual kind of processes uh, or distrib distributed processes across a whole bunch of players. Um, and so... One of the biggest enablers is, um, yes, we have to solve autonomous trucking first. And that, by the way, that's not like an overnight thing. That's decades of continued kind of expansion and work. But um, the first checkpoint uh, in the first route is like, is not that far off. But once you start enabling and you start to learn about how the constraints of autonomous trucking, which are very, very different than the constraints of human trucking, and again, strengths and weaknesses, um, <laughs> Or what if you enable this other constraint? That actually drives the roadmap in a lot of ways because um, this is not like an all or nothing problem. It's, uh, you know, you start to kind of unlock more and more functionality over time. Which functionality most enables this optimization ends up being kind of part of the discussion. But you're totally right. Like you fast forward to like, you know, five years, 10 years. Uh <laughs> the efficiency goes far beyond just direct cost of today's like unit economics of a truck. They go towards reinventing the entire system. Yeah. Um, I think um, how you build around your new set of capabilities, not the old set of capabilities. Yeah, use the analogy metaphor or, or whatever that autonomous trucking is like email versus mail. And then with email, you're still doing the communication, but it opens up all kinds of varieties of communication that you, you didn't anticipate. That's right. Constraints are just completely different. Um, and yeah. 
Yeah, there's a definitely a property of that here. Um, and we're also uh, still learning about it because there there is a lot of really um, fascinating and, and sometimes really elegant things that the industry has done where there's companies whose entire existence is around, despite the constraints, o- optimizing as much as they can out of it. And those lessons do carry over. But it's an interesting kind of merger of worlds to think about like, well, what if um, this was completely different? How would we approach it? Um, and the interesting thing is that um, for a really, really, really long time, it's actually going to be the merger between how to use autonomy and how to use humans mm-hmm. that leans into each each of their strengths. Yeah. And then we're back to Cosmo, <laughs> human-robot <laughs> interaction. So in the int- You could see over time, they might kind of meld together more because you, you'll probably have like zero occupancy vehicles moving around. So you have transportation of goods for short distances and then for slightly longer distances and then slightly longer. And then there'll yeah. be this, then you just see the difference between a passenger vehicle and a truck is just size. And you could have different sizes and all that kind of stuff. And at the core, you can have a way more driver that doesn't, as yeah. long as you have the same sensor that's suite, right. you can just think of it as one problem. And that's why over time, these do comp- kind of converge where in a lot of ways, a lot of the challenges we're solving are freeway driving, which yeah. are going to carry over very well to the vehicles, to the car side. Um, but there are like then unique challenges, like, uh, you have a very different dynamics in your vehicle where you have to see much further out in order to have the proper like response time, because you have an 80,000 pound fully loaded truck. Um, that's a very, very different type of braking profile than a, than a car. You have, uh, really interesting kind of dynamic limits because of the trailer where, you actually, it's very, very hard to like physically like flip a car or do something like physically, mm-hmm. like most risk in a car is from just collisions. Um, yes. It's very hard to like in any normal operation to do something other than like, you know, unless you hit something to actually kind of like roll over or something. On a truck, you actually have to drive much closer to the physical bounds of the safety limits. Um, but you actually have like r- real constraints because you could, uh, you know, you could have uh, really interesting interactions between the cabin and the trailer. Yes. There's something called jackknifing. If you turn, uh, mm-hmm. you know, too quickly, um, you have roll risks and so forth. And so we spend a huge amount of time understanding those boundaries. And those boundaries change based on the load that you have, which is also an interesting difference. And you have to propagate through the al- that through the algorithm so that you're leveraging your dynamic range, but always staying within the safety bounds, but understanding what those safety bounds are. And so... Mm-hmm. We have this like really cool test facility where we like take it to the max and actually imagine a truck with these giant training wheels on the back of the mm-hmm. trailer and you're pushing it past the safety limits uh, yes. in order to like try to actually Understand see where it rolls. And so you ha- you you define this high dimensional boundary, mm-hmm. which then gets captured in software to stay safe and actually do the right thing. But uh, it's kind of fascinating the sort of, uh, you know, kind of challenges you have there. Um, but then all of these things drive really interesting challenges from perception. Cases in a way that is cleanly augmentations of the existing tech stack because a majority of what we're solving is actually generalizable to freeway driving um, and uh, different platforms. And over time, they all start to kind of merge, ideally, where the things that are unique are as as minimal as possible. And that's where you get the most leverage. And that's why Waymo can do, you know, take on $2 trillion opportunities um, and have be nowhere near 2x the cost or investment or size. In fact, it's much, much smaller than that um, because of the high degree of leverage. So what kind of sensor suite they can speak to that, uh, that a long haul truck needs to have? LiDAR, vision, how many... What are we talking about here? Yeah, so it's um, more than the car. So very loose, you can think of as like 2X, but it varies um, depending on the sensor. And so we have like dozens of cameras, radar, and then multiple LiDAR as well. You'll see one difference where the cars have a central main sensor pod on the roof in the middle, and then a, some kind of hood uh, sensors for blind spots. Mm-hmm. The truck moves to two main sensor pods on the outsides where you would typically see, have the mirrors next to the driver. Mm-hmm. The, um, that effectively go as far out as possible, um, kind of up to, to the but boundaries. Up, up the front. Uh, kind of on the cabin, on not the cabin. all the way in the front, but yeah. like kind of... 
edge. Too much occlusion. Too much occlusion. And so then you would add a lot of complexity to the software yeah. to make up for that and, and just unnecessary complexity. There's so many probably fascinating design choices. It's really here. cool. Because you yeah. can probably bring up a ladder higher and have it in the center or something. You you could have all kinds of choices yeah. you to make the decisions here yeah. that ultimately probably will define the industry. <laughs> right, but by having two on the side, there's actually multiple benefits. So one is like... Um, you're just beyond the trailer, so you can see fully flush with the trailer, mm, nice. and so you eliminate most of your blind spot except yes. for right behind the trailer, um, which is which is great because now the software carries over really well, mm -hmm. and the same perception system you use on the car side, largely that architecture can carry over, um, and you can retrain some models and so forth, but you leverage it a lot. It also actually helps with redundancy, where mm -hmm. um, there's a really not nice built-in redundancy for all the LiDAR cameras and radar, where you can afford to have any one of them fail, and you're still okay. And at scale, every one of them will fail. Um, right. And, and so, you will be able to detect when one of them fails because they don't uh, because the redundancy that they're giving you the data that's inconsistent with the rest of the that's right. And it's not just like they no longer give data; it could be like they're fouled or they stop giving data, or the uh, well, some electrical thing gets cut, or you know part of your compute goes down. So what's neat is that like you have way more sensors. Part of it is field of view and occlusions. Part of it's redundancy, and then part of it is new use cases. So there's um uh new types of sensors uh, to optimize for long range and uh, kind of the, the the sensing horizon that we look for uh, on our vehicles um, that is unique to trucks because it actually is like kind of much like further out than, um, than a car. Um, but a majority are actually reused across both cars and trucks. And so we use the same compute, the same uh, fundamental baseline sensors, cameras. <laughs> Camera is a rich source of information that has some strengths, has its weaknesses. What role does LiDAR play? What role does vision um, cameras play in this in this beautiful problem of autonomous trucking? Uh, it is beautiful. There's like so much that comes together. Um, and, and how much, yeah. at, at which point do they come together? Yeah. So, so I'll start with LiDAR. So LiDAR has been like, Waymo's um, uh, one of Waymo's big strengths and advantages, where uh, we developed our own lidar uh, in-house. We're many generations in, both in cost and functionality. It is um, uh, the best in you know in this in this space. Which uh, generation? Because I know there's this there's uh, this cool. I mean, I would love versions that are increasing. Uh, which version of the hardware stack is it at currently? Uh, uh, officially, fifth, publicly, okay. uh, so uh, so some parts iterate more than others. I'm trying to remember on the sensor side. So this, the entire self driving system, which includes sensors and compute, mm -hmm. is fifth generation. Yes, um, I can't and, wait until there's like iPhone style like announcements yeah. for like new versions of the Waymo hardware. Yeah, <laughs> well, we try to be careful because man, when you change the hardware, it takes a lot to like retrain the models and. Yes, uh, yes. And everything. So we just went through that and going from the Pacificas to the Jaguars. Mm -hmm. And so the Jaguars and then the trucks are, you know, have the same generation now. Um, but yeah, the LiDAR is, uh, it's incredible. And so Waymo has um, leaned into that as a strength. And so a lot of the near range perception system kind of that obviously kind of uh, carries over a lot from the car side. Uh, uses LiDAR as a very prominent kind of like primary sensor. Mm -hmm. But then obviously everything has its strengths and weaknesses. And so um, in the near range, uh, LiDAR is a gigantic advantage. Um, and it has its weaknesses on, you know, when it comes to occlusions in certain areas, rain and weather, like, you know, things like that. But it's an incredible sensor and it gives you incredible density, perfect location precision and consistency, which is a very valuable property um, to be able to uh, to kind of apply a mellow approach. Can, can you elaborate consistency? Or... Yeah. When you have a camera, the position of the sun, the time of the day, okay. uh, um, it, various of the properties can have a big impact, uh, whether there's glare, the field of view, things like that. Um, uh, when... So consistent... The signal uh, with uh, yeah, it, it, in the face of a changing external environment, the signal... Yeah, daytime, is... nighttime. It's about 3D... Um, physical existence in effect like you're you're seeing beams of light that bounce physically bounce off of something and come back mm -hmm. and so whatever the conditional conditions are like the shape of a human sensor reading from a human or from a car or from an animal like you have um 
a reliability there, which ends up being valuable for kind of like the long tail of challenges. Yeah. Now, LiDAR is the first sensor to drop off in terms of range, and ours has a really good range, but at the end of the day, um, it drops off. And so particularly for um, uh, for trucks, on top of the general redundancy that you want for near range with, and complements through cameras and radar for occlusions and for complementary information and so forth, when you get to long range, you have to be radar and, and camera primary because your LiDAR data will fundamentally drop off after a period of time, mm-hmm. and you have to be able to see um, kind of objects further out. Now, uh, cameras have uh, the the incredible range um, where you get a high high density, high resolution camera. You can get data, you know, well past a kilometer, and it's like really um, potentially a huge value. Now, the signal drops off, the noise is higher, detecting is harder, classifying is harder, and one that you may not think about localizing is harder because you can be off by like two meters in where something's located a kilometer away. And that's the difference between being on the shoulder and being in your lane. And so you have like interesting challenges there that you have to solve, which have a bunch of approaches that come into it. Um, radar is interesting because um, uh, uh, because it also has longer range than um, than lidar, uh, and it gives you speed information. So it becomes very very useful for dynamic information of traffic flow, uh, vehicle motions, animals pedestrians, like uh, just things that might be um, useful signals. Um, and uh, it helps with weather conditions where radar actually penetrates weather conditions in a better way than um, other sensors. And so it's it's just, it's kind of interesting where we've kind of started to converge towards not thinking about a problem as a LIDAR problem or a camera problem or a radar problem, but it's a fusion problem where these are all like large scale ML problems where you put data into the system. and In many cases, you just look for the signals that might be present in the union of all of these and leave it to the system as much as possible to start to really identify how to um, how to extract that. And then there's places we have to intervene and actually um, include more. But um, no single sensor is in a great position to like really solve this problem. Which point do you fuse them? Do you? Do you? Do you solve the perception problem for each sensor suite individually, the LiDAR suite and the camera suite, or do you do some kind of heterogeneous fusion, or do you fuse at the very beginning? Um, what, what do you, right. is, is there a good answer or at least an inkling of intuitions you can come Yeah, up? so people refer to this as like um, uh, early fusion or late fusion. Yeah. So late fusion might be that you have like the, the camera pipeline, the LiDAR pipeline, and then you like fuse them and like when it gets to like final you know semantics and classification and tracking you like kind of fuse them together and and figure out which one's best um there's more and more evidence that um uh that early fusion is important um and that is because uh weight fusion does not allow you to pick up on the complementary strengths and weaknesses of the sensors um weather's a great example where um, if you do early fusion, you have an incredibly hard problem for any single sensor in rain to solve that problem mm-hmm. um, because you have reflections from the LIDAR. Um, you have, uh, you know, weird kind of noise from the camera, blah, 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 right? But the combination of all of them can help you filter and help you get to the real signal that then gets you as close as possible to the original stack um, and be much more fluid about the strengths and weaknesses where, um you know your camera is much more susceptible to like kind of uh fouling on the on the actual lens from you know like rain or r- random stuff whereas like you might be a little bit more resilient in other sensors and so there's an element of logic that always happens late in the game but that fusion early on you start making constraining decisions that end up being hard to unwind late in the stack so how much of this as a machine learning problem. What role does ML, machine learning, play in this whole uh, problem of autonomous driving, autonomous trucking? Mm-hmm. It's um, massive, and it's increasing over time. You know, if you go back to, um, you know, the grand challenge days in the early days of kind of AV development, um, there was ML, but it was not in like kind of the mass scale data style of mm-hmm. ML. It was like, uh, learning models, but in a more structured um, kind of way. And it was a lot of 
heuristic and search-based approaches and planning and so forth. You can make a lot of progress with these types of approaches um, kind of across the board, an almost deceptive amount of progress. We can get pretty far, but then you re- you start to really grind the further you get in some parts of the stack um, if you don't have an ability to absorb a massive amount of experience in a way that scales very sublinearly in terms of human labor and human attention. And so when you look at the stack, um, the perception side is probably the first to get really revolutionized by ML. And it goes back many years because ML for like computer vision and these types of approaches is, has, kind of took off um, was a lot of the like early kind of push in, um, in deep learning. And so there's always a debate on, you know, the spectrum between kind of like end to end ML, which you know, is a little bit kind of like too far to how you architect it to where you have modules, but enough ability to think about long tail problems and so forth. But at the end of the day, um, you have big parts of the system that are very ML and data driven. And we're increasingly moving that direction all the way across the board, including um, behavior where y- even when it's not like a gigantic ML problem, that covers like a giant swath end to end, more and more parts of the system have this property where you want to be able to put more data into it and it gets better. Um, and that has been one of the realizations is you drive tens of millions of miles and try to like solve new expansions of domains without regressing in your old ones. It becomes intractable for a human to approach that in the way that traditionally robotics has kind of approached some elements of the, of the tech stack. So are you trying to... Um create a data pipeline specifically for the trucking problem is this is it like how, how much leveraging of the autonomous driving is there in terms of data collection yeah and how how unique is the data required for the trucking yeah. problem so we uh we reuse all the same infrastructure um so labeling workflows ml workflows right. everything so that actually carries over quite well um we heavily reuse the data even mm-hmm. where Almost every model that we have on a truck, we started with the latest car model. Cool. And um, so, so it's uh, almost like a good background model. Yeah, it's like you can think of like, you, despite the different domain and different numbers of sensors and position of sensors, there's a lot of signals that carry over across driving. Yeah. And so it's almost like pre-training and getting a big boost out of the gate where you can reduce the amount of data you need by a lot. Um, and it goes both ways. <laughs> react to a truck. Yeah, it's a little bit different, but the fundamentals are actually like, what will other vehicles in the road do? There's a lot of carryover that's possible. And in fact, um, just to give you an example, uh, we're constantly kind of like adding more data from the trucking side. But as of right now, um, when we think of our, like one of our models, behavior prediction for other um, agents on the road, like Mm -hmm. vehicles, um, 85% of that data comes from cars. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of that 85% comes from surface streets um, because we just had so much of it and it was really valuable. Mm-hmm. And so... be Very valuable. Now, we do have some very unique challenges where there's a sparsity of events on a freeway. Um, the frequency of events happening on a freeway, whether it's, you know, interesting you know, objects in the road or incidents or or even like from a human benchmark, like how often does a human have an accident on a mm-hmm. freeway is far more sparse than on a surface street. And so that leads to really interesting data problems where uh, you can't just drive infinitely to encounter all the different permutations of things you might encounter. And so there you get into interesting uh, tools like structured testing and data collection, data augmentation, and so forth. And so there's really interesting kind of technical challenges that push some of the research um, that enables um, these new new suites of approaches. What role does simulation play? Really good question. So Waymo simulates about a thousand miles for every mile it drives. Um, mm-hmm. So you think of- In both, so across the board. Across the board, yeah. Uh, so you think of, for example, well, if we've driven, you know, over 20 million miles, that's over 20 billion miles in simulation. Right. Now, how do you use simulation? Um, it's uh, multi-purpose. So uh, you use it for basic development. So you want to do, make sure you, you have regression prevention and protection of everything you're doing, right? Um, that That's an easy one. Um, when you encounter something interesting in the world, let's say there was an issue with how the vehicle behaved versus an ideal human. 
um, you can play that back in simulation and start augmenting your system and seeing how you would have reacted to that scenario. All the way to the validation phase where to actually see your human relative safety of like how well are you performing on the car side or the trucking side relative to a human, um, a lot of that safety case is actually driven by uh, taking all of the physical operational driving, which probably includes a lot of interventions where like where the operate the driver took over just in case, um, and then you simulate those forward and see if would anything have happened. And in most cases, the answer is no, but you you can simulate it forward. And you can even start to do really interesting things where you add virtual agents to create harder environments. You can fuzz the locations of physical agents. You can muck with the scene and stress test the scenario from a whole bunch of different dimensions. And effectively, you're trying to like more efficiently sample this like infinite dimensional space, but try to encounter the problems as fast as possible. <laughs> What is your collision, r human relative kind of collision rate uh, for all these types of scenarios and and uh, uh, and severities mm -hmm. to make sure that you're better than a human bar, you know, by by a good amount. Um, but that's not actually the most useful for development. For development, it's much more kind of analog metrics that are part of the art of finding how what what are the properties of driving that give you a way quicker signal that's more sensitive than a collision that can correlate to qual the quality you care about and push the feedback loop to all of your development. A lot of these are, for example, comparisons to human drivers, mm -hmm. like manual drivers. Uh, how do you how do you do relative to a human driver in various dimensions or various um, circumstances? Can I ask you a, a, a tricky question? So if I brought you a truck, how would you test it? Okay, Alan Turing came along and you said this one's can't tell if it's a human driver or yeah, a exactly. autonomous driver yeah but not the human because cuz you know humans are flawed it's but yeah, yeah. yeah how but do yeah. you actually know you're ready basically yeah. like yeah. and how do you know it's good yeah. enough um yeah and and by the way this is the reason why like um Waymo released a safety framework for the car side because like one it sets the bar so nobody cuts below it um and does something bad for the field that and that causes an accident and two it's to start the conversation on on like framing what does this need to look like same thing we'll, we'll end up doing for the trucking side um there it ends up being above the speed limit that's actually pretty easy like you can fundamentally prove that it's either impossible to violate that rule or that in these like you can um itemize the scenarios where that comes up and you can do a test and show that you, you know, you pass that test and therefore you can handle that scenario. Mm -hmm. And so those are like traditional structured testing kind of system engineering approaches where you can just quantify, like uh, fault rates is another example where when something fails, how do you deal with it? You're not going to drive and randomly wait for it to fail. You're going to force a failure and make sure that you can handle it in mm -hmm. closed courses and simulation or on the road um, and uh, and run through all the permutations of failures, which you can oftentimes, for some parts of the system, itemize like hardware. Mm -hmm. um, the hardest part is behavioral, where mm -hmm. you have just infinite situations that could, in theory, happen, um, and you want to figure out the the combinations of approaches that you know that can work there you can probably pass the turing test pretty quickly even if you're not like completely ready for driverless because the events that are really kind of like hard will not happen that often just to give you a perspective um uh, a human has a serious accident on a freeway uh like a truck driver on a freeway has uh, there's <laughs> um and so you go through a huge amount of kind of structured approaches in order to validate it. And then by by thoroughness, you can make a strong argument that you're ready to go. This is actually a harder problem in a lot of ways, though, because you can think of a space shuttle as um, getting to a fixed point and then you kind of like, or an airplane and you like freeze the software and then you like prove it and you're good to go. Here you have to get to a driverless quality bar, but then continue to aggressively change the software 
even while you're driverless. And so, and also the full range of environment that you there's there's an external environment with a shuttle. It's, you're basically testing the like the systems, the internal stuff. Yeah, uh, and you have a lot of control in the external stuff. Yeah, and the hard part is how do you know you didn't get worse in something that you just changed? Yes, um, sure. And so, uh, so in a lot of ways, like. Um, the Turing test starts to fail pretty quickly because you start to feel driverless quality um, pretty early in that curve. Um, if you think about it, right, like in most um, most uh, kind of you know really good AV demos, maybe you'll sit there for thirty minutes, right? Yeah. Um, so you've driven you know fifteen miles or something like that. Um, to go driverless, uh, like what's the sort of rate of issues that you need to have? You won't even encounter. So, so let's try something different. Then let's try a different version of the Turing test, which is like an IQ test. Uh -huh. So there's these difficult questions of increasing difficulty. They're very, they're, they're designed. You don't know them ahead of time. Nobody knows the answer to them. Right. And so is it possible to, in the future, orchestrate yeah. basically really Obstacle difficult- Obstacle course almost of like- yeah, yeah. That maybe change every year and that represent if you can pass these, it they don't necessarily represent the full spectrum. That's it. Yeah, uh, they but, won't be conclusive, but you can at least get a really quick read and filter. Yeah, um, like you're able to. Yeah, because you didn't know them ahead of time. Like I don't know. Uh, yeah. pro probably, <laughs> like construction zones, uh, failures, or or driving yeah. anywhere in Russia. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Snow, <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, weather. Um, Cut-ins, yes. uh, dense traffic, kind of merging Cut lane closures, yeah, yeah. Merging, uh, yeah. animal, foreign objects on a road that pop out on short notice, mm -hmm. mechanical failures, sensor breaking, tire popped, weird behaviors by other vehicles, like a hard brake, something reckless that they've done, fouling of sensors like bugs or birds, you, yeah. you know, poop or something. So, like, But yeah, like you have these like kind of like extreme... Uh, Like if you think of traditional ML, like you know how there's like a validation set where you hold out some data and uh, like real world driving is the ultimate validation set. That's the, right. in the end, like the cleanest signal. Um, but you can do a really good job on creating an obstacle course. And you're absolutely right. Like at the end, um, if there was such a thing as automate. For him, it's handcrafted. Yeah. And that it requires like human genius or ingenuity to create a really good test. Yeah. And you hold, you truly hold it out. It's an interesting perspective on the validation set, which is like, make that as hard as possible. Right. Not a generic representation of the data, but this is the hardest. The hardest thing. stuff. Yeah. You know, it's like go, like you'll never out fully itemize like all the world states that you'll, you'll expand. And so you have to come up with different approaches. And this is where you start hitting the struggles of ML where ML is fantastic. You'll always be surprised by things you'll encounter. You feel good about your ability to generalize from what you've learned. All right. Let me ask you a tricky question. So to me, the two companies that are building at scale some of the most incredible robots ever built is Waymo and Tesla. Mm -hmm. So there's very distinct approaches, technically, philosophically, in these two systems. Let me ask you to play sort of devil's advocate and then the devil's advocate to the devil's advocate. It's it's a bit of a race. Of course, everyone can win. Uh, but if Waymo wins this race to level four, uh, which why would they win? What aspect of the approach do you think would be the winning aspect? And if Tesla wins, why would they win? And uh, which aspect of their approach would be the reason? Just just building some intuition, almost not from a business perspective, from any of yeah. that, just technically. Yeah. I, yeah. And we could summarize, I think maybe you can correct me, what one of the more distinct aspects is uh Waymo has a richer suite of sensors as LIDAR and vision. Tesla now removed radar. They do 
um, in numbers of miles than what you earn. And the gap from really kind of like decent progress for L2 and so forth to what it takes to actually go L4. And at the end of the day, um, there's a feeling that Waymo has, uh, there's a long way to go. Uh, nobody's won, um, but the, there's a lot of advantages um, in all of these buckets where it's the only company that has shipped a fully driverless service where you can go and you can use it and it's at a decently like uh, you know sizable scale. Um, and those learnings can feed forward into solve, how to solve the more general problem. And you see this process, you've deployed it in, yeah. in Chandler. Uh, you don't different problem. If you think about it, like, um, let's say we were designing an L2 truck that was meant to be safer and help a human. You could do that with far less sensors, far less complexity, and provide value very quickly, arguably with what we already have today, just packaged up in a good product. But you would take a huge risk in having a gap from even the like compute and sensors, not not to mention the software, to then jump from that system to an L4 system. So it's a huge risk, basically. So I can let me allow me to be the person that plays the devil's advocate and that argue for yeah. the Tesla approach. Yeah. So that the what you just laid out makes perfect sense and is exactly right. There are some open questions here, which is, it's possible that investing more in faster data collection, which is essentially what Tesla's doing, will get us there faster if the sensor suite doesn't matter yeah. as much and machine learning can do a lot of the work. This is the open question is, how much is, is the thing you mentioned before, how much of driving can be end-to-end -end learned? Mm -hmm. That's the open question. Uh, obviously, the, the Waymo and the vision-only machine learning approach will solve driving eventually, both. Yeah. The question is of timeline. What's faster? That's right. And what you mentioned, like if I were to make the opposite argument, like what, what puts Tesla uh, in, in the strongest position, it's data. That is their like superpower where they have an access to real world data effectively with like a safety driver uh, yes. and, a, you know, like <laughs> they've, they found a way to like um, get paid by safety drivers versus pay for safety drivers, <laughs> yeah. right? Like it's uh, it's brilliant, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, you know, all joking aside, like um, one, it is incredible that they've built a business that's incredibly successful that can now be a foundation and bootstrap. And solve the problem that humans obviously are solving with, you know, with vision systems. But question it's is when it's a risk uh yeah, it's a big it's a risk. Ri so there's no argument that it's not a risk right like right. um and it's already such a hard problem and so much of that problem by the way is um uh you know even beyond the perception side some of the hardest elements of the problem are on the behavioral side and decision making and the long tail safety case if you are adding risk and complexity on the input side from perception you're now making a really really hard problem like <laughs> The long tail of computer vision is really, really hard. And there's a lot of ways that that can come up. And even if it doesn't happen that often at all, when you think about the safety bar and what it takes to actually go full driverless, not like incredible assistance driverless, but full driverless, um, that bar gets crazy high. And not only do you have to solve it on the behavioral side, but now you have to push computer vision beyond arguably where it's ever been pushed. And so you now on top of the broader AV challenge, you have a really hard perception challenge as well. So there's, there's perception, there's planning, there's human robot interaction. To me, what's fascinating about <clears throat> what Tesla is doing is in this march towards level four, because it's in the hands of so many humans, you get to see video, you get to see humans. I mean, forget, yeah. forget companies, forget businesses. It's fascinating for humans to be interacting with robots. That's well, incredible. And they're actually helping kind of push it forward. And, yeah. and that is valuable, by the way, where even for us, a decent percentage of our data is human driving. Yes. Um, we intentionally have humans drive higher percentage than you might expect because that creates some of the best signals to train the autonomy. Mm -hmm. And so that is uh, on its own a value. So, so together we're kind of learning about this problem in an applied sense, just like you had with Cosmo. Like when it's, 
when it, when you're chasing an actual product that people are going to use ro ro robot based product that people are going to use you have to contend with the reality of what it takes to build a robot that successfully perceives the world and operates in the world and what it takes to have a robot that interacts with other humans in the world and yeah. that that's like to me one of the most interesting problems humans have ever undertaken because you're uh, in trying to create an intelligent agent that operates in a human world yeah. you're also understanding the nature of intelligence itself like how hard is driving is still not answered to me yeah i still don't understand the, like and all the subtle cues like even little things like um your interaction with a pedestrian where you look at each other and just go okay yeah. go right yeah. like that's hard to do with same journalists that you mentioned to get excited for a demo are the ones who will who will, um, write long articles about the, the, the failure of your company if there's w one accident mm -hmm. Um, that's based on a robot and it's 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 just society is so tense and waiting for failure of robots you're in the yeah. such a high stake environment failure has such a high cost and it slows down development of regression forces so much more rigor that you know obviously you know you have to find a compromise on like okay well how often do we release driverless builds because every time you release a driverless build you have to go through this like validation mm -hmm. process which is very expensive and so forth so um it is interesting it's like it's, it is this one of the hardest things there's no other industry where like uh you would not like you wouldn't release products way way quicker when you start to kind of provide even portions of the value that, that you provide healthcare maybe is the other one uh, health that's yeah. right that's but at the same time right like we've gotten there where you think of like surgery right like you have surgery there's always a risk but like it's really really bounded you know that there's an accident rate when you go out and drive your car today right like uh, uh to be able to explain to society how do we quantify the risk um and acknowledge that there is some non-zero risk, but it's far above a human, um, you know, relative safety. See, here's the thing: to push back a little bit uh, and bring Cosmo back in the conversation, you said something quite brilliant at the beginning of this conversation that I think probably applies for autonomous driving, which is, you know, there's this desire to make autonomous cars more safer than human-driven cars, but if you create a product that's really compelling and is able to explain both the leadership and the engineers and the product itself can communicate intent, then I think people may be able to be willing to put up with a thing that might be even riskier than humans because they understand of robotics problem. Oh, that and many the, accidents like are not even under, like due to you, right? Obviously right. it's a, so, there's a big difference though. Um, yeah. You are, that's not a personal decision. You're also impacting obviously kind of the rest of the road um, and we're facilitating it, right? And so there's a higher kind of, you know, kind of ethical and moral bar, which obviously then, you know, translates into as a society and from a regulatory standpoint, kind of like what, what, what comes out of it where it's hard for us to ever see this even being a uh, debate in the sense that like you have to be beyond reproach from a safety standpoint because if you're wrong about this you could set the entire field back a decade right see i i this is me speaking i think if we look into the future there will be i personally believe this is me speaking yeah that there will be less and less focus on safety that still very very high yeah Meaning, but, like after autonomy is very common and accepted, yeah, you but not to... not not so common as everywhere. But there yeah. there has to be a transition yeah. because I think for innovation, just like you were saying, to explore ideas, you have to take risks. And I think if autonomy in the near term is to become prevalent in society, I think people need to be more willing to understand the nature of risk, the value of risk. Um, it's it's very difficult you're right of course with driving but that that's the fascinating nature of it this it's a it's a it's a life and death 
situation that brings value to millions of people. So yeah. you have to figure out what what do we value about this world? Yeah. How much do we value? How deeply do we want to avoid hurting other humans? That's right. And there is a point where like, you can imagine a scenario where Waymo has a system that is, uh, even when it's like uh, kind of beyond a you know human relative safety, um, and provably statistically will save lives, there is a thoughtful navigation of like any technology. There's early adopters, and then there's kind of like a curve mm -hmm. that um, happens after it. But and eventually, celebrities you get the rock in a way more vehicle, and then everybody just comes. And along. then everybody comes down because the rock <laughs> likes it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> if he posts the yeah, uh, him, yeah. Uh, and it's yeah. like it's an open question on how this plays out. I mean, maybe we're pleasantly surprised, and it just like people just realize that this is such a enabler of life and uh, like efficiency and cost and everything that um, there's a pull like at some point i actually fully believe that this will go from a thoughtful kind of how much how much that tipping point like in a really short amount of time actually turns into a societal pull to kind of embrace the benefits of this yeah i i hope so it seems like in the recent few decades there's been tipping points for technologies where like overnight <laughs> trucks now in the United States. Do you see a future where there's millions of Waymo trucks and maybe just broadly speaking, Waymo vehicles, just like like ants running around the United yeah. States uh, freeways and, and local roads? Yeah, in other countries too. Like uh, you look back decades from now and it might be one of those things that just feels so natural and then it becomes almost like a kind of interesting kind of oddity that we had none of it like, uh, you know, kind of decades earlier. Um, and it'll take a long time to grow and scale. Very different challenges appear at every stage. But over time, like, this is one of the most enabling technologies that, um, that we have in the world uh, today. Um, it'll feel like, you know, how was the world before the internet? How was the world before mobile phones? Like it's going to have that sort of a feeling to it on both sides. It's hard to predict the future, but do you sometimes uh, think about weird ways it might change the world, like surprising ways? So obviously there's more direct ways where like uh, there's increases efficiency. It will enable a lot of kind of logistics optimizations kind of things. It will... <laughs> type of uh, 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 type of experience in urban environments. I, I think there was like a statistic that uh, uh, something like 30% of the traffic uh, in cities during rush hour is caused by uh, pursuit of parking um, or some, some, like some really high stats. So th those obviously kind of open up a lot of options. Um, flexibility on goods will enable new industries and businesses that never existed before because now the efficiency becomes um, more palatable. Good delivery, timing, consistency, and flexibility is going to change. The way we distribute the logistics network will change. The way we then can integrate with warehousing, with um, shipping, ports, you can start to think about greater automation through the whole kind of stack uh, and how that supply chain, the ripples become much more... Uh, Agile versus like very grindy the way they are uh, today, where it just the, the adaptation is like very tough and there's like a lot of constraints that we have. I think it'll be great for the environment. It'll be great for safety, where like probably about 95% of that. Negative consequences, the positive consequences. And we tend to focus on the negative a little bit too much. Uh, in fact, autonomous trucks are often brought up as an example of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and robots in general taking our jobs. And as we've talked about briefly here, we talk a lot with Steve, you know, th that's, it is a concern that automation will take away certain jobs, it'll create other jobs, so there's temporary pain 
uh, hopefully temporary, but pain is pain and uh, people suffer. And that human suffering is really important to think about yeah, how, uh, but trucking is, ver I mean, there's a lot written on this is, I would say far from the, the thing that would, that would cause the most pain. Yeah, there's even more positive properties about trucking where not only is there just a you know huge shortage which is gonna increase, the average age of truck drivers is getting closer to 50 because the younger people aren't wanting to come into it. They're trying to like incentivize, lower the age limit, like all these sort of things. Um, and the demand is just gonna increase. And the least favorable, like, I mean, it depends on the person, but in most cases, the least favorable types of routes are the massive long haul routes where you're on the road away from your family 300 plus days yeah, a year. Yeah, Steve talked about the pain of those kind of yeah. routes from a family perspective. You're, you're basically away from family. It's not just hours, you work insane hours, but it's also just time away from family. And just Obesity rate is through the roof because you're just sitting all day like, uh, um, it's really, really tough. And um, uh, and that's also where like the biggest kind of safety risk is because of fatigue. And um, and so when you think of a, the gradual evolution of how trucking comes. The, the routes and the portions of trucking that are going to require humans the longest and benefit the most from humans are the short haul and most complicated kind of yes. more urban routes, which are also the more more, more pleasant ones, which are um, you know, less continual driving time, more um, uh, uh, more flexibility on like you know geography and location, and you get to kind of sleep with the, at home with, at, your, at your own home. And, and, so. and very importantly, if you optimize the logistics, you're going to use human. You're going to hu use humans much better, That's right. and and thereby pay them much better because like one one of the biggest problems is truck drivers currently are paid by like how much they drive so you, they really feel the pain of it, inefficient logistics yeah because like if they're just sitting around for hours which they often do not driving waiting yeah they're not getting paid for that time that's right and, and that so like logistics has a significant yeah. impact on the quality of life of a truck driver yeah. and a high percentage of trucks are like uh empty because <laughs> the overall net like volume of the system tends to increase, right? Like the the entire market cap of trucking is going to go up um, when the efficiency improves uh, and facilitates both growth in industries and better utilization of trucking. Uh this is true for trucking, but if we zoom out broader, you know, automation and AI does technology broadly, I would say. Yeah. But, you know, automation is a thing that, has a potential in the next couple of decades to shift the kind of jobs available to humans. Yes. And so that results in, like I said, human suffering because people lose their jobs. There's economic pain there. Sure, and there's, sure. there's also a pain of meaning. So for, for a lot of people, work is a s source of uh, meaning. It's a source of identity, of uh, of pride, of, you know, Pride in getting good at the job, pride in craftsmanship and excellence, which is what truck We're in a row where like the seven shelves that contain the seven items are lined up and a, you know, laser or whatever points to what you need to get and you go and pick it and you place it to mm -hmm. fill the order. And so the people are fulfilling the final orders. What was interesting about that is that when I was asking them about like kind of the impact on labor, when they transitioned that warehouse, the throughput increased so much that the jobs shifted towards the final fulfillment, even though the robots took over entirely the the search of the items themselves, mm -hmm. and the labor the job stayed like nobody like there was it was actually the same amount of jobs mm -hmm. uh, roughly that were necessary, but the throughput increased by like I think over two x or some mm -hmm. some amount right like so. Um, you have these situations that are not zero-sum games in this really interesting yeah. way. And the optimist in me thinks that there's these types of solutions in almost any industry where the growth that's enabled creates opportunities that you can then leverage. Yeah. But you got to be intentional about finding those and really helping make those links because any, even if you make the argument that like there's a net positive, locally there's always tough hits that you got to be very careful about. That's right. You have to have an understanding of that link because there's a short period of time 
whether training is acquired or just mental transition or physical or whatever is acquired, that's still going to be short-term pain. The uncertainty of it, there's families involved. You know, it, it, it's, it, I mean, it's ex exceptionally, it's difficult on a human level. And you have to really think about that. Uh, even yeah. You can't just look at economic metrics always. It's human beings. That's right. And and you can't even just uh, take it as like, okay, well, we need to like subsidize or whatever, because like there is an element of just personal pride where right. majority of people, like people don't want to just be okay, but like they want to actually like have a craft, like you said, and yeah. have a, a, a mission and uh, yeah. feel like they're having a really positive impact. And so... Um, my personal belief is that there's a lot of transferability and skill set um, that is possible, especially if you create a bridge and an, and an investment um, to enable it. Um, and to some degree, they're also very good partners, actually, for us uh, as we kind of just integrated a lot of shared technology. But um, if I could also get your thoughts on, you, know, you could think of uh, Alexa as a robot as well, yeah. uh, Echo. Do you see those as fundamentally different? Just because you can move and look around, is that fundamentally yeah. different than a thing that just sits in place? Uh, it opens up options, um, but uh, you know, my, my, my first reaction is I think like, I, don't, I, uh, I have my doubts that this one's gonna hit the mark because I think for the price point that it's at and the like kind of functionality and value propositions that they're, I'm trying to put out it's uh, uh, it's still searching for like the kill application that like justify. But it has to be utilized in the right way. Um, yeah. And so that's going to be the biggest challenge is like, can you meet the bar of what a cons what the mass market consumer like, you know, think like, you know, our uh, our neighbors, our friend parents, like would they find a deep, deep value like in, you know, in this at a mass scale that, you know, that justifies the price point. I think that's in the end, one of the biggest challenges for robotics, especially consumer robotics, um, where you have to kind of meet that bar, uh, it becomes very, very hard. Um, and there's also the, the higher bar, just like you were saying with Cosmo, of, you know, a thing that can look one way and then turn around and look at you there's that's either a super desirable quality or super undesirable quality yeah. depending on how much you trust the thing that's right and so there's uh there's a problem of trust to solve there there's a problem of personality it's the thing the it's the quote-unquote problem that cosmos solved so well yeah is that there you trust the thing yeah and that has to do with the company with the leadership with the f intent that's communicated by the device and the company and all right. everything together yeah, exactly right. Uh, and so, um, and then I think they also have to retrace some of the like learnings on the character side where like, as usual, I think that's the place where it's uh, a lot of companies are great at the hardware side of it and can, you know, think about those elements. And then there's like, you know, the thinking about the AI challenges, particularly with the advantage of Alexa is a, is a pretty huge boost for them. Um, the character side of it for technology companies is pretty new, novel territory. And so that um, will take some iterations, but, um, yeah, I mean, I hope, uh, I hope there's continued progress in the space and that thread doesn't kind of go dormant for too long. Um, and it's not, you know, it's going to take a while to kind of evolve into like the ideal applications, but you know, th this is one of, um, Amazon's, I guess it, like you could call it, it's definitely like part of their DNA, but in many cases is also strength where they're very willing to like iterate, uh, kind of aggressively and, um, and move quickly. And um, take risks. And take I mean, risks well, you have and, deep pockets, so you can yeah. kind of... Yeah, and then maybe have more misfires than an Apple would. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's different styles and different approaches. And, um, you know, it, at the end of the day, it's like uh, there's a few familiar uh, kind of elements there for sure, which was, uh, you know, kind of... You know, Homage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is one way to put it. Yeah. Uh, so why is it so hard at a high level... Um, to build a robotics company, a, a robotics company that lives for a long time. So if if you look at, so I thought Cosmo for sure would live for a very long time. That to me was exceptionally successful vision and idea and implementation. Uh, iRobot is an example of a company that has pivoted in all the right ways to survive. 
yeah. and, and arguably thrive by focusing on the having like a have a driver that constantly provides profit, which is the vacuum cleaner. And of course, there's like Amazon. What they're what they're doing is they're almost like taking risks so they can afford it because they have other sources of, of revenue, right? But outside of those examples, most robotics companies fail. Yeah. Uh, why Why do they fail? Why is it so hard to run a robotics company? Are robots impressive because they have, um, you know, you, not only do you have to like hit the function, but you have to educate and explain, get awareness up, deal with different types of consumers like, uh, you know, there's um, there's a reason why a lot of technologies sometimes start in the enterprise space and then kind of continue forward in the consumer space. Even like, you know, you see AR like starting to kind of make that shift with HoloLens and so forth uh, in some ways. Consumers and price points that they're willing to kind of uh, be attracted in a mass market way. And I don't mean like, you know, 10,000 enthusiasts bought it, but I mean like, you know, 2 million, 10 million, 50 million like mass market kind of yes. interest, uh, you know, have bought it. Um, that bar is very, very high. And typically robotics is novel enough and non-standardized enough to where it pushes on price points so much that you can easily get out of range where the capabilities and today's technology or just the function that was picked just doesn't line up. Um, and so that so, product yeah. market fit is very important. So the, the space of killer apps or a rather super compelling apps is much smaller because it's easy to get outside of the price range. Yeah, and it's most well, consumers, and it's not constant, right? Like, yeah. and that's why, like, we picked off entertainment because the quality was just so low in physical entertainment that we could, we felt we could leapfrog that and still create like a really compelling offering at a price point that was defensible, and and we like that proved out to be true, um, and. Over time, that same opportunity opens up in healthcare, in home applications, in you know commercial uh, applications, in kind of broader, more generalized interface. But there's missing pieces in order for that to happen, and all of those have to be present um, for it to line up. And we see these sort of trends in technology where um, you know kind of technologies that start in one place evolve and mm-hmm. kind of grow to another. Some things start in gaming. Some things start in um, uh, uh, in space uh, or aerospace and then kind of move into the consumer market. And sometimes it's just a timing thing, right? Where how many stabs at what became the iPhone were there over the 20 years before yes. that just weren't quite ready in the function. Um, yeah, history repeats itself in a lot of ways uh, in, in a lot of these trends, which is pretty fascinating. Well, let me ask you about the humanoid form. What do you think about the Tesla bot and humanoid robotics in general? So obviously, to me, autonomous driving, uh, Waymo and the other companies working in the space, that seems to be a great place to invest in potential revolutionary application robotics, application, folks, application. What's the role of humanoid robotics? Do you think... Tesla bot is ridiculous? Do you think it's super promising? Do you think it's interesting, full of mystery? If you're doing a humanoid robot, oftentimes it's in the pursuit of a humanoid robot, not in the pursuit of an application for the time being. Yes. Um, especially when you have like kind of the gaps in interface and, you know, kind of AI that we kind of talk about today. So, Anything Elon does, I'm interested in, in following. So there's yeah. a, there's an element of that world. No like, matter how crazy, yeah, how crazy it is, I just like I, you know I'll pay attention and I'm curious yeah. to see what comes out of it. So it's like you can't you can't ever you know ignore it. But you know it's uh, definitely far afield from their kind of core business, um, uh, obviously. And um, what, what was interesting to me is I've I've disagreed with you know Elon a lot about this. Is to me, the in- the compelling aspect of the humanoid form and a lot of kind of robots, Cosmo, for example, is the human-robot interaction part. Yeah. Uh, from Elon Musk's perspective, the Tesla bot has nothing to do with the human. It's a form that's effective for the factory because the factory is designed for humans. But to me, the reason you might want to argue for the humanoid yeah. form is because, you know, at a party, 
Yeah. Uh, it's a nice way to fit into the party. The yeah. humanoid form has a compelling notion to it in the same way that Cosmo is compelling. Mm -hmm. I, I, you, I would argue, if we were arguing about this, that it's cheaper to build a, a, a Cosmo like yeah. that form. But if you wanted to make an argument, which I have with Jim Keller about, you know, you could actually make a humanoid robot for pretty cheap. It's possible. And uh, then the question is, all right, if, if you're using an application where it can be flawed, um, it could it can have a personality and be flawed in the same way that Cosmo is. That maybe it's interesting for integration to human society. Mm -hmm. That's that's to me is an interesting application of a humanoid form because humans are drawn like I mentioned to you, legged robots. Yeah. We're drawn to legs and limbs yeah. and body language and all that kind of stuff. And even a face, even if you don't have the facial features, which you might not want to have for the. Uh, the, the, not, to, to reduce the creepiness factor, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, that to me, the humanoid form is compelling. But in terms of that being the right form for the factory environment, I'm not so sure. Yeah, for the factory environment, like right off the bat, um, what are you optimizing for? Is it strength? Is it mobility? Is it versatility, right? Like that changes completely the look and feel of the robot that you yeah. create. You know, and uh, almost certainly the human form is over designed for some dimensions and constrained for some dimensions and so like the, the, like what are you grasping is it big is it little right so you would customize it and make it um customizable um for the different needs if that was the optimization right and then you know for the other one uh i could totally be wrong you know i still feel that the closer you try to get to a human the more you're subject to the um biases of what a human should be and you lose flexibility to shift away from your weaknesses uh, and towards your strengths. And that changes over time, but there's ways to make really approachable and natural interfaces for robotic kind of characters and, you know, and, and uh, you know, and the kind of deployments in these applications that do not at all look like a human directly, but that actually creates way more flexibility and capability and, and role and forgiveness and interface and everything else. Yeah, it's interesting, but... Um, the one that's carried by Waymo as well is when you're solving the general robotics problem of uh, perception control, where the, it's, the, there's the very clear applications of driving, it's as you get better and better at it, when you have like way more driver, yeah, the whole world starts to kind of start to look like a robotics problem. So it's yeah. very interesting. For now, your detection, classification, yeah. segmentation, tracking, planning, like it's curious. Yeah. So there's no reason. I mean, I'm not. I'm not speaking for Waymo here, but you know, um, moving goods. There's no reason transformer like this thing couldn't you know uh take the goods up an elevator you know yeah like that like uh slowly expand yeah what it means to move goods and expand more and more of the world uh into a robotics problem well that's right and you start to like think of it as an end-to-end -end robotics problem from like yeah. loading from you know from everything yes and even like the truck itself um you know, today's generation is integrating into today's understanding of what a vehicle is, right? The, a Pacifica, Jaguar, uh, the, the freight liners from Daimler. There's nothing that stops these us from like down the road after like starting to get to scale to like expand these partnerships to really rethink what would the next generation of a truck look like um, that is actually optimized for autonomy, not for today's world. Um, and maybe that means a very different type of trailer. Maybe that, like, there's a lot of things you could rethink on that front, which is on its own very, very exciting. Let me ask you, like I said, you went to the mecca of robotics, <laughs> which is CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. You got a PhD there. So maybe by way of advice and maybe by way of story and memories, what does it take to get a PhD in robotics at CMU? And maybe you can throw in there some advice for people who are thinking about 
doing work in artificial intelligence and robotics and are thinking about whether to get a PhD. It's funny because I asked you what I was a uh, CMU for undergrad as well and didn't know anything about robotics coming in and was doing, you know, electrical computer engineering, computer science, and really got more and more into kind of AI and then fell in love with autonomous driving. And at that point, like that was just by a big margin, like such a incredible, like central spot of, uh, of develop, of investment in that area. And so what I would say is that like robotics, like for all the progress that's happened is still a really young field. There's a huge amount of opportunity. Now that opportunity shifted where something like autonomous driving has moved from being very research and academics driven to being commercial driven where you see the investments happening um, in commercial. Now there's other areas that are much younger um, and you see like kind of grasping and manipulation, making kind of the same sort of journey that like autonomy made. And there's a, a vision, systems, hardware, sensors, all these separate things. You do need to like go deep and find something that you're like really, really passionate uh, about. Obviously, like just like any PhD, this is like a five, six year kind of uh, endeavor. And you have to love it enough to go super deep to learn all the things necessary to be super deeply functioning in that area and then contribute to it in a way that hasn't been done before. And in robotics, that probably means um, more breadth because robotics is rarely kind of like one particular kind of narrow technology. And it means being able to collaborate with teams where like one of the coolest aspects of like my the, exp the experience that I like kind of cherish in our PhD is that we actually had a pretty large AV project that for that time was like a pretty serious initiative where you got to like partner with a large environment. Yeah. So like forests, ditches, rocks, vegetation. And so it was like a really, really interesting kind of a hard problem where like wheels would be up to my shoulders. It's like gigantic, yeah. right? Yeah. By the way, AV for people stands for autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so what I, what I think is like the beauty of robotics, but also kind of like the expectation is that um, there's um, spaces in computer science where you can be very, very narrow and deep. Mm -hmm. Robotics, one of the the necessity, but also the beauty of it is that it forces you to be excited about that breadth and that partnership across different disciplines that enable it. But that also opens up so many more doors where you can go and you can do robotics in almost any category where robotics isn't a in, isn't really an industry. It's like it, it's like AI, right? It's like the application of physical automation to uh, you know to all these other worlds. And so you can do robotic surgery, you can do vehicles, you can do factory automation, you can do healthcare, or you can do like uh, leverage the AI around the sensing to think about static sensors and scene understanding. So um, so I think that's got to be the expectation and the excitement. And it uh, breeds people that are probably a little bit more collaborative and more uh, excited about um, working in teams. Uh, if I could briefly comment on the fact that the robotics people I've met in my life uh, from CMU and MIT, they're really happy people. Yeah, because I think it's the collaborative thing. Yeah. I think I think you don't you. <laughs> You're not like a sitting in like the fourth basement. Uh, yes, exactly. With, like, Which yeah. when you're doing machine learning purely software, yeah. it's very tempting to just disappear into your own hole yeah. and never collaborate. And and there that breeds a little bit more of the silo mentality of like. I have a problem. It's almost like negative to talk to somebody else or yeah. something like that. But robotics folks are just very collaborative, very yeah. friendly. And just and there's also an energy a, of like a, you get to confront the physics of reality often, yeah. which is humbling and also exciting. So it's humbling when it it yeah. fails and exciting when it finally. It's works. like a purity of the passion. You got to remember that, like right now, like robotics and AI is like just all the rage and autonomous vehicles and all this, like 15 years ago and 20 years ago, like it wasn't that deeply lucrative. People that went into robotics, they did it because they were like 
thought it was just the coolest thing in the world yeah. to like make physical things intelligent yeah. in the real world. And so there's like a raw passion where they went into it for the right reasons and so forth. And so it's really great space. And that organizational challenge, by the way, like um, when you think about the challenges in AV, we talk a lot about the technical challenges. The organization. This is the Lex Free Podcast.